Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Doran. I am a technical sales specialist for Global Test Supply. Thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar via the Global Test Supply University. Today's topic will be covering introduction to acoustic sound imaging with Fluke. Throughout the presentation, we ask that you uh, kindly mute your uh, microphone. The presentation will last between 40 and 45 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end of the presentation uh, for Q&A. <clears throat> we are going to encourage you that uh, throughout the presentation to submit uh, any and all questions that you have using the chat feature. And as I just mentioned, we'll get to all your questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, Global Tesla has been working closely with Fluke for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Fluke Electronics. This is a result of our dedication to uh, dedication to offering you uh, our product expertise, service, and competitive pricing. Getting started today, uh, the webinar will be presented by Ken Reeves from Fluke. Ken is Fluke's territory sales rep uh, based in Alberta, Canada. Uh, he has over 31 years of technical test equipment sales, including 20 of which working with Fluke directly. Ken, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Chris, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, we are here today to talk about a couple of exciting new products and an exciting new product category of uh, what we call sonic industrial imagers or acoustical sound imaging tools. Uh, we have a few things we want to cover off today. Um, I'll just leave the agenda up there, but the goal at the end of the day um, is to give you, first of all, an introduction to the technology, what it is, um, what Fluke tools are available, um, how the two models different because we have a, an II-900 and an II-910. And then uh, also run through some application images at the end and obviously open it up for questions. Um, we'd love to get some questions in the text ch uh, chat box. Um, so feel free to text away and uh, Chris will load them up. So uh, at the end, we'll have some uh, further discussion. Without any further ado, let's uh, get into what acoustical imaging is all about. So initially taking a look at it acoustical imaging might look to you like a thermal image but rather than showing temperature overlaid on top of a visible image uh, what we're showing to you is uh, sound energy um, creating what we call a sound map and what we do is we uh, create an energy map of where the sound is coming from and how stronger and how intense it is and how many points of sound we have uh, we lay that on top of a visible light image, creating what we call sound sight, and that it gives us the ability to show uh, sound and its location and strength uh, with a handheld device. Um, that sound image is what we're here to talk about today. So ultrasound is typically above our audible range. Um, the II-900 and II-910 can see from uh, about 5 kilohertz to uh, 50,000 hertz. Um, most people can't hear above uh, 20, and, and if you're older like me, it's even lower than that. Um, but what we do is we have the ability to hear high frequency with this device and convert it into a visual screen. Now, ultrasound technology has been around for many, many, many years in various different forms. If you've uh, ever been to the doctor to get an ultrasound, they're actually putting a sound wave into you and measuring the reflection to be able to map out what you look like inside. Um, we use ultrasound for cleaning welding, uh, sorry, parts, uh, welding plastic metal together. Um, but what we're here to talk about is this new technology is um, effectively replacing uh, what was done before with handheld devices to measure ultrasound. So before, um, you would have to have an ultrasound measurement tool um, that would use a parabolic curve and listen to ultrasound. Uh, usually you've had a set of headphones on to be able to convert and hear what that frequency sounded like and different sounds meant different free, different types of leaks. Um, they were pretty hard to work at a distance. So when you were trying to scan an area, it was very difficult to, to find out where a particular leak might be coming from. There was usually training required to make these ultrasound tools really effective for you. And uh, because it was a training type situation, not it wasn't fully or widely deployed um, as, a, as a potential tool. Um, if you weren't able to get close because it wasn't able to see far away, um, if you weren't able to get close, you'd have to put up scaffolding or wear PPE or even get hot work permits to be able to get access to certain areas. So sometimes at the end of the day, uh, customers considered that some ultrasonic tools, unless it was you know nearly obvious or used after a repair, it wasn't really worth the effort as a scanning tool. 
Um, by the way, if you take a look at the picture there, this is uh, Chris Cassidy. He's a NASA astronaut, NASA astronaut, and uh, he was using an ultrasound leak detector with a set of headphones on the space station, um, the ISS, to uh, try to find a leak, and uh, hopefully he found it. Okay, so let's talk about the workflow. Um, and this is really what we're here to change in terms of what the technology can make improvements for. So the workflow in the past used to be involved scanning a large area. Um, the person on the lower left-hand corner, he's using an ultrasound detector with a parabolic uh, microphone. Um, that parabolic microphone is pretty hard to see in this image, it's clear. Um, but he was trying to scan a wide area, listen very carefully for a specific type of sound. And if he heard something, he would change the probe and try to get closer with it and make an indication that, yeah, that's exactly what I hear as a sound. Um, it sounds like it's a leak. He'd pull a tag out of his back pocket, write on the tag, mark it, and then, you know, tell somebody to, later to go back and make a fix and continue on with the scanning. Um, this whole process took a lot of time. And if you could just even imagine looking at my little picture there of how you would find a leak in that scanning area, it'd be pretty difficult. So we went to a customer location very early on in the process of uh, introducing the IA900, and uh, we asked them to demonstrate how they would find a leak. So again, they scanned, listening point by point, trying to find out where a leak is across a wide area. And we were there for about 20 minutes, and he found one leak and tagged it. Um, with the, we put the IA900 in his hands, and he was, again, able to scan over a wide area and uh, take a look at what he did. Um, he was able to scan, he found two leaks in under five minutes, scanning the same area, and uh, was able to pinpoint that leak, uh, come over and where, where he thought there was one leak, there was actually two. So a uh, very interesting takeaway from that first very early discussion. So let's talk about the i 900 and give you an introduction to it as a product. What does it look like? How does it work? What are the menus? Let's have a look. So again, we're delivering the sound map and sound sight technology where we combine it with a visible image. And uh, this is the first time that anything like this has been to the industry. And it really does a, a good job of changing um, kind of the mindset on how we approach compressed air leaks. The, the device itself, um, I got one in front of me and if you have your camera running, you can see or you see on my camera, that's the size of it right here. Um, it has a seven inch touch screen on it. Uh, it's got a one green button for uh, saving and uh, images and videos and one another green button on the lower uh, right hand left hand side sorry to turn the unit off and on um, this model was introduced in april 2019 and uh, it has um, done very well for us we turn the unit around and it's got 64 precision tuned acoustical microphones in a specific array layout and a visible light camera which is in the center of the image and that's where we take the sound image and the visible and overlay them together. Um, when we launched the product, we were very focused on looking at customers and targeting customers that had compressed air systems, vacuums, or other gases that might have been leaking. And the reason is that when we go out and talk um, specifically with them, we were finding that because they weren't doing these types of tests, um, it was pretty expensive, all the costs that were adding up. Uh, you take a look at the capital cost, which is the cost of the actual equipment. Um, if the equipment was running more than it needed to, um, it would be wearing out faster and need to be replaced. So there's a significant amount of money attached to that type of leaking, um, especially on the big capital equipment for compressed air systems. From a product quality point of view, um, a lot of products that you may be making or a lot of uh, you know end results of your, of your equipment um, can be directly affected by either having low pressure or not enough volume of air to be able to run your tools or the product quality itself might become very, very um, poor. Uh, and being able to get a handle on your leaks um, would you know, prevent you having to buy a new compressor or again, not waste your product at the back end of your production. Uh, energy costs, you might not be aware, but compressing air is actually not that efficient. It's about a seven to one ratio to electrical energy. Uh, the problem is, is if you're leaking air, you've leaked what cost you a lot in the first place and it's a continuous expense. The cost of gases, if you are buying gases, say for instance, you're buying nitrogen or argon for welding or any of these other type of gases that you, know, you would um, not be able to produce on your own, 
uh, you would basically, if you had leaks in those systems, you would potentially be uh, taking your contracted price and tearing it up and wasting that. So um, a lot of people do spend some time taking a look at gases that are under pressure that aren't air, but they uh, sometimes consider air as just a cost of doing business. From a manpower perspective, um, again, we've already alluded how much time it takes to find a leak. Uh, so being able to put this new technology in your hands will eliminate that part of it. Um, also the training side, which you know doesn't necessarily get discussed a whole bunch. Um, there's very little training required to be able to make this unit run for you. Uh, we'll get into a few slides here later that will um, hopefully make that a little more clear to you as to how well we can uh, see these leaks. There was a um, particular customer that worked with us very early on, and uh, they have um, four compressors that were running, and they wanted to get a handle on their leaks. So they put a fluke power quality analyzer on the compressors. Uh, this graph here adds them all up, so we got an idea of what's going on. And uh, when they went off and made some repairs using the I-900, about a week later, they were able to do a similar test and showed that just making the repairs on that compressed air system saved them 25% of their electrical bill, uh, which in their case um, equated to about uh, $50,000. And that was an annual saving. So that not only saved them in that first year, but continuously year after year. And then owning the I-910 gave them the, sorry, the I-900 gave them the ability to, uh, first of all, confirm that the repairs were made and then also find any new leaks that come up to keep those costs in bay. So you might be asking yourself, or you might be interested who we consider a potential customer for an I-900 to be. If you are a large facility and you have large uh, compressed air systems, um, you are definitely up our alley in terms of where the I-900 can help save you some money. Um, these are just a list on the left-hand side of different types of companies that are out there. Uh, you may be involved with discrete manufacturing, process manufacturing, oil and gas, or even other applications, for instance, hospitals or power plants. The, the actions that customers are taking right now to you know, get a handle on their leaks, um, there may be existing PM programs in place. This product would make it much easier and faster and uh, potentially return time and effort back to your team to do other events. Um, they, if you have somebody coming in to do contracted services, uh, maybe on a yearly or six month basis, you may be effectively able to um, you know, offset that cost and do it in house. Or if you are happen to be a service provider, having something like an I-900 or an I-910 available to you would make you faster and more efficient with your customers. You'd be able to do more and ultimately bill out more for all of the efforts that you have put in. So let's uh, slow the presentation down here a little bit and talk a little bit about the II-900 and its actual functionality. So this is a sample screen of what an I-900 looks like. Um, the things I wanna highlight to you are not necessarily what's on the screen, but on the right-hand side, uh, we start off with the frequency scale. Uh, the unit will be able to show you frequency from um, just around five kilohertz to 50,000 hertz. Uh, the yellow section that is, you know, up that sidebar is a graphical representation of the noise that it's hearing. Uh, just to the left of that, there's a dB scale, um, what we call a color palette that we can show you. It can be turned off and on, and it gives you a range for what the device is hearing for total dB. Um, there's a center box reading, a center point reading, sorry, that you can turn off and on. There is general info, battery, date, time that can be on the display as well if you want to. And then on the left-hand side, when you touch the display anywhere, um, out pops the side menu. And that's what the next set of slides will talk about is the different menu functions we have available. So starting at the top, there's image and memory. So the image, um, this is a slide from right when we first launched the II-900. Um, and at that point in time, we had the ability to capture an image and capture video. Um, when you capture an image, it's typically a JPEG image of what you see on the display. Um, because it's a JPEG, you don't need any uh, special software. You just connect this up to your computer and it shows up like a secondary drive or a jump drive. Um, and it's no software required to get the image off of the device itself. Now, when you select the memory button, um, it gives you a review of the memory that's in the unit. It's sorted by date. 
and then you just click on, just use your finger to touch them, and they, they give the ability to uh, open them up and review them. The next down the menu is the acoustics and the palette. Uh, the acoustics gives you a little bit of uh, control over some of the things you want on the display, like the um, like the dB scale or the center box, things like that. Um, the palette, uh, the unit comes defaulted with red blue, but I would caution if you plan on using or sharing these images with uh, with somebody else that they may be colorblind and you may not be aware of it. And the problem with the red blue scale, just like thermal imaging, is it doesn't do necessarily a good job of communicating the differences to those folks. So um, we recommend you just move it into one of the monochromatic scales, which is the gray, um, the black, white, gray scale or the uh, iron bow, which is the one in the middle on that uh, that image at the top. It's kind of the purpley yellow one. So let's talk about some best practices or practical considerations on how the I-900 gets used. So first of all, um, we get a lot of questions and you're welcome to ask them in the text uh, chat area, um, even if you want more clarity beyond what I'm saying here. But uh, what we do is we have, because it's a touch screen, we have direct connection capability by touching the screen to adjust a filter. You can adjust the upper and lower limit or slide the filter up and down, depending on where you think you're hearing some frequency. Um, and it removes all the uh, noise that is not a part of that filter. So if you're in a noisy environment and you have a lot of other mechanical that you audibly hear with your own ears that might be 2K, uh, sorry, 20,000 Hertz and below, we'll be able to filter all, all that noise and focus in directly on a specific frequency um, that you may have associated with a leak, okay? Um, so you operate this very simply, very easily. I, I put this in the hands of uh, my kids and they're a little older now, but even uh, they can just quickly, easy run stuff. So I wanna show you this video. This is an interesting um, practical consideration that you need to keep in mind. Um, high frequency has a tendency to bounce off of hard surfaces. So if you do see something on the display, uh, we recommend that you move around a little bit. And if that spot moves with you, then that you're not actually looking at uh, the source of the high frequency. So let's run the video and uh, you'll notice that what appears to be a leak in one of those lines on the floor um, actually, when we move, it starts bouncing off of the floor, and we know that's not the source of the ultrasonic. So we go down and find that it's actually a leaking air fitting happening from underneath the table. So uh, just like before, you can walk through and uh, see uh, particular problems, but we always recommend that you confirm, you move to confirm the, the location of the sound. So from a performance point of view, we've touched on a couple of things here, but I do wanna bring a little bit of information to your attention. So it has a seven inch capacitive touch LCD display. It can see leaks. And when I say leaks, I mean more than one um, up to as far away as 164 feet, or if uh, you're interested, it's about 50 meters away, half a football field. Uh, we can store up to about a thousand images on the device. Um, they can be stored as a JPEG, as I mentioned earlier, or a PNG file. We also have the ability to store up to five minutes of fully blended video as an MP4 file. The unit comes with two batteries and each battery lasts about six hours and it will recharge in about three hours. So effectively, if you're putting the uh, chargers, uh, the batteries in the charger base, um, and you're rotating them as they wear out, you'll never ever be out of power. So more than just compressed air, we have the ability to see vacuum, we can see steams, or we can see other gases as we've mentioned before. Now, we have a special feature um, on the ii 900 that we launched at the beginning of this year um, called Leak Q Mode. And uh, I'd like to describe that to you and, and get an under, help you get an understanding of what we do. So what leak Q mode does is under the image tab, we all not only have um, image video, but we've now added something called leak Q. So when you're looking at something that you see to be a leak and you activate leak Q, up comes a circle on the display. Inside, if the target is inside that circle, we will measure the distance to it and give it a severity leak, leak Q scale rating from zero to 10. 
you know, what does that zero to 10 mean to us? Um, it doesn't mean much. It just gives us an idea of what's how severe that leak is. But in behind the scenes, we save this as an AS2 file. You can export that file from your computer into our website. And from there, answer a couple of quick questions. In other words, we already know the distance. We already know that it was compressed air. But if it wasn't compressed air, you could say it was a gas that you're paying for and how much that gas is costing you. We can uh, take the leak Q severity rate, which in this case is listed as 6.6. .6, and the measured dB was 76.3. And we, we tell it that the system was running at 88 PSI when the pressure uh, was taken. And we estimate the leak size in CFM. And based on the energy cost and maybe the leak gas cost, we prioritize that for you and give you an actual estimated cost of that particular leak. So if you had 20 of these leaks that you captured and you wanted to send them to the to the website and get them prioritized for you, um, it's all something that you can do. And you come back and you get a bunch of reports and you say, which one's costing me the most? And that's where you put your most amount of time and effort. So super cool. There's a couple of things that I want you to pay attention to, um, mostly with applications that we officially don't do with the II-900. So refrigerant leaks, uh, the problem there is that the refrigerant system is typically a closed system. Um, there's not another source of any extra refrigerant. And once it leaks, it goes out and it's gone. Uh, the other problem is, is that the leaks, when they typically happen, they're quite small. And the only real way to properly detect a refrigerant leak is with a sniffer. Um, it's in the parts per million range, and we just don't have the ability to see that with an II-910 or an II-900, sorry. So uh, let me just click here. That means we don't do this one. Uh, let's talk quickly about partial discharge. Um, partial discharge is something that our customers were coming back to us with. They bought an II-900 for either production quality issues or getting a handle on their leaks. And then the electrical department got their hands on it and said, hey, I can see PD, can you do this? And uh, the answer was kind of, yeah, but. Um, the problem is, is that partial discharge um, begins at a higher frequency than 50 kilohertz. So once it gets down to around 50 kilohertz, yes, we can start to see it with a, an IA900. Um, but it's problematic in terms of being able to fully support the application because uh, we couldn't see it soon enough to be comfortable to say that yes we would be able to detect pd so what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we now have a new product called an ia910 and it will support partial discharge um, it has the ability to get to a hundred thousand hertz so twice the frequency range and uh, we will definitely be able to see pd so this is the same product, but it has two new technologies. So the first one on the left talks about the partial discharge. And at the same time, when we went back to the drawing board, we increased the sensitivity of the actual microphones. And we can see smaller leaks, even more precise, at a farther distance. So let's talk, first of all, about this uh, partial discharge. So if you're not familiar, and you've heard me mention partial discharge or PD a couple of times, uh, partial discharge is a charge that does not completely bridge a gap between two conductors through or across an insulator. It usually happens on medium and high voltage electrical equipment, such as transformers, bus bars, inside of cabinets and whatnot. And the people that are most likely concerned about this are where, first of all, the high voltage, high energy systems are, because they're typically feeding like neighborhoods or feeding a whole particular plant and if there's ever a problem there it's like the whole plant or the whole neighborhood goes out or a whole bunch of people are affected. Um, traditionally detecting PD was done through either very sophisticated electrical measuring tools that Fluke doesn't have or with um, a UV IR camera that was looking for the ionization of the gases that surround the PD incidents. Um, they were very expensive um, both of those were pretty pricey types of pieces of equipment, and therefore PD was done either by a utility or typically contracted at a plant. Um, so let's talk quickly about PD um, in terms of what we can actually do. So this particular graph, um, this page, shows us the four different types of PD. We have corona discharge, which is 
you know, the PD that tendrils off of uh, conductors attempting to reach into the air. It's like when you see a lightning bolt and you see those extra little pieces coming off the side of the lightning bolt, that's really what corona is. Uh, surface discharge, that's where you have two conductors and it's trying to track across the surface. Um, typically at the beginning, it's not seen visually. I know that the image there shows it visually, but uh, in the very early stages, it's really only being able to see um, using something like the I910. Um, arcing, that's a very visual one that you can see when it happens, and uh, it's typically creates a plasma discharge. And yes, we can see it, but if, you, if that's the point in time, you usually have a, a bigger issue. Um, the one that I want to highlight it here in yellow as a bit of a warning or pay attention to, um, voids um, in con insulating materials actually create little PD events internally across the voltage gradient. And those are typically found in cables, bushings, and whatnot. Uh, we have the ability to see them depending on how deep they are. So it's it's one of these applications that kind of like back to the watchouts that we had earlier. Um, it's something that we can do. We're just not fully supporting it. Um, but if you come across a, a cabinet and you're scanning for PD across the surface and you happen to see a cable that is showing you a, a a particular high frequency event, there's a real good chance that you have some PD in that, perhaps that bushing or the connection. So I've kind of alluded to it here already a couple of times, but there's several different financial reasons um, for getting a handle on PD. Um, there's some maintenance issues. You don't want equipment to basically fault because that requires, for the most part, a complete replacement of any of the equipment associated with an arc flash. Um, arc flashes are very dangerous, so um, keeping teams safe and people safe, uh, finding these types of problems ahead of time is uh, very valuable. And then there's always cost and energy savings, um, primarily uh, to do with, you know, the actual labor and repair and whatnot of finding and solving PD problems. Going back to the screen again, uh, let's talk quickly about the uh, low, you know, the low pressure or extra precise uh, capabilities in the I-910. Now, granted, these are pictures from an I-900, um, but to kind of set the stage, um, if you're an instrumentation person, you know that that's a 3 to 15 PSI bellows um, happening on the top right image there. Um, I believe that one was done at about 15 PSI and we were able to see the leak. Um, there's also a natural gas fitting down below uh, where it's leaking at the stem and this particular one has an interesting story. Um, the customer smelled natural gas for months on end but couldn't find the leak and uh, we were able to find the leak with an I-900 in about two minutes. But the I-910 has increased sensitivity so we're going to be able to see even lower pressures or even less dense gases away from farther away. Leaks themselves, um, we talked about them already in terms of their cost savings. Um, I just think, you know, lowering that, finding more earlier or being able to see uh, leaks that were not available on the I-900 with the I-910 is going to expand our capabilities and uh, eventually save you more money on all those other applications. So, Let's talk about some of the features and functions. First of all, the II-910 still has this leak Q mode that I talked about, um, but it also adds a PDQ mode, which is the ability to look at PD and measure PD counts, um, which allows us to estimate the amount of corona that's happening based on the type and the pulse sizes. Um, if I understand it right, I'm not a PD expert, but um, if I understand it right, the PD count is well used within industry and it's nice that we're able to communicate the same way as everybody else using our equipment. Again, video recording up to five minutes, the sound map image, that stays the same, same touch screen as the other device. Um, the really interesting thing here is we've been able to extend it to 100 kilohertz and that gives us the ability to detect leaks earlier for discharges across wider frequencies. Um, on a previous slide, and I didn't allude to it here, but let me just back up if you don't mind. This one here, on the lower right-hand corner, this is not a Fluke graphic. It was grabbed um, from a different company off the web. I have to go detail whether to which one it was, but and it's hard to see. But if you were to understand that um, at a higher frequency, 
when the cost to repair is lower, um, that's where the iron antenna starts to take in effect. Um, as the problem gets worse and worse, it starts to drop out of that high frequency into lower frequency ranges. Eventually it becomes audible or you can measure with a thermal imager, um, but then eventually it'll just blow up and completely get destroyed. So the ability of having the II-910 manage uh, the uh, detection of um, frequencies up to 100 kilohertz gives us that time to be able to solve the problem sooner and event, uh, get rid of the problems before they turn into big problems. We did not have to change our IP rating on the device. It's the same as the other model, same number of microphones, um, battery life is the same, but if you notice, uh, we have the ability to detect at longer distances. So up to 394 feet away, we can see any of the functions, PD, leaks, you name it, we can see them. So here's a comparison between the two units. Um, there's a few things highlighted here. Um, the PDQ mode on the II-910 is there. The higher frequency is range is there, the farther detection. Um, the only little caveat to pay attention to is we have had a slight reduction in the temperature range from 45 degrees C to 40 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to convert that over in my head, but um, it's about 10 degrees less uh, Fahrenheit. And Let's talk about some applications. So this particular application shot, again, was done with an I-900, um, and it's just a typical compressed air drop. Um, the interesting thing from this particular image is you see all the noise below the 40 kilohertz. Like it's quite a significantly noisy environment, and we were still able to just filter in and focus right in and find one particular leak on a compressor, uh, a compressed air drop down. Again, uh, same kind of noisy environment uh, where the compressor was running, but we can see um, directly there a compressor connection and similarly a leak off of a regulator, which in some cases may not be uh, something you can manage, but the fact that you can see it is, is pretty good because it's usually very, very low pressure at that point. This is a bottling plant. Um, if you take a look at what's moving by in red, you might be able to figure out which company it is. Again, um, they use a lot of compressed air and they also have compressed gases um, in the form of carbon dioxide. And um, they want to be able to manage those leaks because they're paying for those gases or they're paying to compress the air on the production system and when a leak or a problem happens and you know a simple thing like an actuator doesn't shift and, and you know push across so that the uh, the production line goes to a different direction creates a pretty big problem so we were able to again again a very noisy environment pinpoint a particular leak this is a leak on a nitrogen system and similarly ammonia compressor leak Ammonia is uh, potentially a very deadly gas, so it's nice to be able to show that we can measure those and see them. Um, this is a gas that you're paying for if you're a welder. It's argon. Uh, again, we see the tank. Um, the interesting thing to measure is that's not a measurement on the tank. The tank's not leaking where the little crosshairs are. That's actually the reflection of that leak uh, bouncing off that hard surface. Uh, tractor trailers use air brakes um, and you can see a compressed air leak on them pretty quick and easy. I wouldn't suggest that somebody's going to go buy an I-900 to do a lot of compressed airs unless you're uh, manufacturing perhaps and testing quality control before it goes out the door. We've talked a couple of times about vacuums. Um, when ducts leak, uh, it's pretty hard sometimes for even the traditional equipment to see vacuum leaks, but the I-900 does an excellent job of being able to pinpoint where an actual duct leak is in vacuum. Uh, no different than that uh, picture with the, the gentleman from the space station who was looking at a vacuum leak on the ISS. Um, vacuums create the same turbulent air uh, that we're picking up as high frequency. And if you've been in a coal plant, um, you'll know how noisy they can be. Now, this is a partial discharge image. Um, I put it in the slide deck just to give you an indication of um, you know, the fact that we can see it with an I-900. The I-910 might have been able to pick this problem up sooner. Um, you notice it's all fenced in. This is a controlled area and it's definitely high voltage in there. But the fact that we're able to see surface tracking and uh, that's really what the image is here to show. 
and again that natural gas connection the one i talked about earlier where the um, customer had it happening for a long time could spell the natural gas but couldn't find the leak and we were able to in a matter of minutes um, that's this application picture again so it's been uh, just over a half hour here. Um, I am going to uh, open the floor to questions. And again, questions come in the form of texting. And so I will pass it over to Chris, who I believe is uh, managing the texting for us, for the questions. Uh, I am indeed. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ken. Um, so as Ken mentioned, this is now time for any and all of your questions. We have about 25 minutes to get to all of them, so that's plenty of time. Uh, please use the chat feature um, to submit any and all of your questions. I will say in advance for questions related to pricing, availability, rental units, demos, anything of the like, you can email sales at globaltestsupply.com and our sales staff will get in touch with you and answer your questions that way. Uh, so again, related to <clears throat> pricing, availability, rental units, demo units, and the like, uh, you can email us directly. So throughout the presentation, uh, we did get a couple questions in. A uh, okay. question from Murad um, was compressed air should be detectable, uh, detectable sorry, uh, via thermal imager because of the gas law. Why use an acoustic sound imaging unit? Actually, the really interesting thing about uh, thermal imaging and gas law and whatnot is there's only a few materials in the world that will emit infrared energy and if you don't have the right thermal imager um, to and the ones that are commercially available that you typically buy to look at electrical connections or motors or bearings or whatever you're using a thermal imager for they actually one of the major advantages they have is that they can actually see through gas to be able to get to the surface so if I had a plume of warm air in front of it um, or cold air or whatever the case may be, you wouldn't see it with a thermal imager at all. It would just look right through it. Um, if you were to look for specific gases, um, methane is an example that comes to mind. Um, you need to consider a mid-wave camera. That's something that Fluke doesn't make. Um, but Fluke is investigating the opportunity to be able to make these really low pressure application measurements in that environment. So. Um, we don't have an application we can support today for that type of application, but um, to get back to your question, thermal imagers won't see air. They see through it. I hope that answers your question. If you have a follow-up, feel free to text it. Absolutely, please do. Uh, so a reminder, use the chat feature uh, for your questions. Another one that comes up um, pretty often uh, in terms of knowing how to set the unit up is, how do we know what frequency to set it up depending on the application we're using? So that's a really good question. Um, usually what winds up happening is when you start scanning, um, the first part of your time is going to be uh, setting the camera, setting the, the imager up uh, to operate in a frequency range um, above your audible range, keep it quite high and quite wide and then uh, scan the area. If you see any little blips on the yellow side, that'll give you an indication that there is actually a, a noise happening at that particular frequency. Then you can you tighten it up, uh, either lower or raise the two um, uh, level controls or slide it up and down, sliding both at the same time and narrow in and focus in. There's no one set frequency that is gonna work for all applications. And that's why we give you that kind of easy control. Um, I know that we can go in and it looks like it's flashing around, but usually within two or three minutes, we're able to narrow down and find a leak if, if we know that's there. It's pretty easy to find. If, even if we don't know what's there, we just you know scan around and, and get it. It's typically in the 25 to 35, 40 kilohertz range. I hope that answers the question. Perfect, no, that's, uh, that's perfect. Um, another question in, does leak detection re require direct line of sight? Example, would we be able to detect something behind walls or underground possibly? Um, yeah, we unfortunately need line of sight. Um, high frequency has a tendency to bounce around. So if it's behind a wall, um, it would be bouncing off the other side of the wall and going back in um, and not coming through the material of the wall, say drywall or or uh, gyp rock or whatever your material of your 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 wall is made out of. Um, so yes, you need line of sight. Um, that's um, 
I'm going to put a little caveat there. There, there is some opportunity if if the sound is strong enough to get through the surface of you know insulating material. Um, but the reality is, is that for most all applications, you need line of sight. Sometimes you'll find it like you'll find it as a reflection first of all, and then as you move, it's moving. You'll be able to go and then come back and find out where the source is. And it might be behind a wall, or it might be on a different, you know, not directly in line of sight when you're first looking for it, but you're seeing the reflection first. Uh, another question that came in was, um, what would be the suggested calibration schedule? Good question. Um, calibration, just like a thermal imager, um, is, uh, how can I say it, without making the calibration folks upset? Um, <laughs> If, if you need to calibrate a thermal imager, it's typically because there's like a spot or a place on the image that's just not going away. Um, so you'll want to calibrate so that they're all measuring the same temperature at the same time. Same idea with this device. If you happen to have a spot or an area where it thinks there's a sound, but as you're moving, it's it's just not going away, that's probably time to send it back in for recalibration. Um, the unit has a three-year warranty, so if you ever had a problem like that, you would send it back in. If you're looking to calibrate the actual sound energy, um, I'm not even sure if we have the ability to provide a calibration certificate. I know it doesn't come with the unit, um, and I don't know if that's something that um, you folks at Global Test Supply can manage. Um, but yeah, that that kind of bridges beyond um, what most people would use a, a sonic imager for is mostly for scanning and mostly for detection. And again, if you have a problem that's moving with you all the time, then it's time to send it in. I can definitely follow up with our lab because uh, like you, I'm not 100% certain if uh, we have the ability to do so at the yeah. moment, but certainly something to look into. Um, we had a question just come in. It's a tad off topic from Phil. Uh, but he is wondering, will Fluke at some point in the future offer a device that can see audio frequencies that would enable to set up surround sound systems or <laughs> audio reproduction rooms or anything of the like? So I will, I will defer to our mission statement at Fluke. Um, if you dig around on our website somewhere, you'll find something that comes to the kind of the idea that we want to be um, engage with maintenance professionals, um, and almost all the tools that we have do that. Um, when it comes to setting up surround sounds or setting up audio, that's not our core customer. And I would probably defer to somebody else that maybe has technology, maybe even similar to this, that is intending to work in that environment. Um, I'm not convinced that we'll ever go down that path to support that type of application. I'm not saying that we won't, maybe somebody knows something I don't know. But um, most everything we bring out has to do with um, helping professionals keep their world up and running, being more efficient, helping them migrate from predictive, sorry, preventative maintenance to predictive maintenance programs, which will eventually free up their time and reduce their costs and give them return on investments. All of those typical um, advantages that, that Fluke is attempting to bring to the market with technology is focused primarily on those folks. So I hope that answered the question, sorry. That's not perfect. not totally off topic, but I hope uh, it answered the less. It's close enough to answer. That's definitely uh, valid enough. Thank you, Phil. Uh, so, uh, for as a reminder, I have a question. Please use the chat feature. We got a little over 15 minutes, so plenty of time still to get to any and all of your questions. I urge you to take advantage of having Ken connected here, who is a product uh, expert and can answer even questions that are not directly related. <laughs> Um, so another question that came in uh, that I've seen personally uh, quite often is um, having to do with minimum pressure. Okay. So, so yeah, is there a minimum pressure needed? The sound that gets created um, that we're measuring is actually a function of pressure, the density of the gas. Um, there is some temperature component to it as well, but when those all combine together, it creates the frequency that we're measuring. And um, there was a bit of an internal competition within Fluke to kind of see who could get the lowest frequency or sorry, lowest um, uh, pressure. And I did hear somebody was able to measure something down around four PSI uh, with an II-900. Um, as I showed you earlier, there's that bezel bellows um, that's a 3 to 15 pressure system and 
confidently it was at 15 psi um, because I was involved with the image. So um, um, I know that we can get down to 15 psi, no problem on compressed air. Uh, in fact, um, I suspect we'll be able to get a little lower. And then with the I910, it would be even lower than that. Um, it's difficult for us to come out with a particular specification because there's too many variables at play. Um, so what I suggest is if you have a low pressure application that you'd like to confirm that this will work for you or not, is to get a, get a hold of the folks at uh, Global Test Supply um, at that sales address. I'll let Chris explain that again. Um, but we'll be able to uh, connect with you and get you what you need to make a decision. Um, that's That's what we're here for. So as a great follow-up to that, the email address again is sales at globaltestsupply.com. Uh, that's for any questions that uh, are better directed in a more direct or private fashion that we can follow up with Ken uh, if need be, as well as any demo questions, pricing, availability, rental, anything of the like, sales at globaltestsupply.com. Uh, we have another question um, about electrical noise from faulty contactors or circuit breakers. Will the 900 and the 910 pick it up? Yeah, yes, it will. Um, those those noises are picked up even if, if they're audible, we can see them. Um, I'm going to try this real quick here. Okay, Chris, I'm going to show you that one in my cabinet I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know I got the fluke backdrop here, but I'm actually... Um, at my place in Edmonton in the basement and uh, I've occupied my wife's art studio so um, it happens to be right by the electrical panel so um, if you want to indulge me for a second here I'll see if I can uh, show you an image that I took just a minute just before the session I'll just let the camera come up um, so I don't know if you can see on your little camera image there or not and I'll try to drive it in reverse here but by tapping um, just a little bit higher Ken How's that? that? That's much better, yeah. Okay, so if I tap anywhere on the display, the menu comes across, and I hit memory, and uh, this particular image I just took today, that's my electrical panel, which is just to my uh, right here, uh, your left, um, and this is actually one of those little tiny uh, wall adapters. It's plugged into a 120 volt electrical outlet here, and uh, I noticed on the, when I was, actually what I was doing, I was just scanning around the, the, the room here, and it was bouncing off the hardwood floor, so then I tried to figure out what it was, and the door was slightly ajar. And uh, I opened up the door, and there it was, clear as day. Um, you notice the notch? There's a notch in it at uh, just under 25 uh, kilohertz. So I'm not quite sure if I need to replace that or not, <laughs> but that's the kind of noise you're talking about with electrical breakers and circuits. You'll see stuff like that that's above the audible range, and you'll clearly be able to pick it off. And I just did that like literally uh, an hour ago. Cool. Perfect. Uh, so another reminder, folks, just a little over 10 minutes left uh, to answer any, any and all questions. Use the chat feature. Uh, let's see. Um, something that's come up uh, previously is in terms of uh, how we can share photos uh, taken through the 900 or the 910 to a maintenance staff repair team, et cetera. Yep. Uh, I know that you and I talked about uh, previously having compatibility with Fluke Connect, but maybe you can kind of walk us through how it sure. would be store and safe. So the i 900 that's what this model is, and the i 910 for that matter, have a uh, USB-C connection on the bottom of the device, just right here, sorry. And uh, that connects down to a, uh, using a typical USB cable to connect down into your computer. Uh, when you connect it into your computer, um, on your file memory system under Windows or uh, Finder under Mac, it'll show up as an external drive, just like if you plugged in a zip drive or a, you know, a USB stick. And it'll show up there. It'll say Fluke I-900 on that. And then when you click into the memory system or the uh, actual file structure, you'll find a file for images and a file for video. Excuse me. And you'll be able to go in there, take a look, and you'll be basically looking at the same... Uh, file structure as you would over here on men on the uh, images uh, the memory on the i900 from there you can take those images off share them send them to wherever they need to go back into your cms cmms program share them with another team member that has both the you know the visible light image and the um the sound map laid over to create that sound site function 
where we can show you what looks like uh, like the image as to where it is leaking and how severe it is. You can share that information quickly and easily right from your Windows program for managing your files. So you don't need any external software. There's nothing that's required to buy, nothing that's required to um, you know connect to to be able to see images. It's all done very quick and easily. Perfect. Um... So we did touch on this uh, earlier um, with the uh, the slide on the uh, on the the mystery customer with the red cans. What about extremely um, high noise areas and extremely noisy areas? <clears throat> Is there a way to make sure that it can be accurate and can it be used to its full capacity within those areas? Yeah. So I've been in areas where you have to wear you know those. Um, compressible earplugs and then a set of headphones over top with a hard hat and uh, we walked in those environments and it, it's it's actually like shaking the floor it's very noisy um, and we were able to very quickly and easy sh show the i900 and pinpoint you know even little compressed air leaks um, feeding systems in there because the filtering is so strong that we can just focus right in on exactly what it is that we're looking for um, so if you have anything that's you know on the extreme end that you want to confirm before you buy something from us, um, just talk to the folks at Global Test Supply and they'll hook you up with a demo or whatever it takes, maybe even rent it for a week or two to see if that's what you need to buy. Definitely, definitely. And just be uh, and just going back because uh, we didn't have the conversion, but we did have a question about uh, this ambient air temperature effect. And just to throw it in, um, yeah. the the conversion between the operating temperature is approximately 15 to about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So would yeah. ambient temperature affect that at all? So in, in the fluke world, when we create specifications on any of our equipment, we always have a temperature operating range and a humidity associated with that. And then also in the data sheet, we may have a storage range. Um, I know for a fact that the operating range on the um, II-900 is from 10 minus 10 degrees Celsius to plus 45 degrees Celsius. And Chris has got the conversions there that he alluded to. Um, and it runs from 10 degrees, sorry, 10% to 95% non-condensing. So every function, every feature, the touch screen, the all the microphones, everything about the camera, that's, everything that's written on the data sheet will be functional in that range. Um, I know that I live in Alberta and it can get to be minus, I think it's minus 10 today, um, but it might very well be uh, minus 20, minus 30. Um, if somebody's had it in storage, that's really not a problem. We just ask them to bring it out, warm it up and then put it to use, um, just so that everything's all working within that range. Outside of that range, um, we don't expect the unit just to come to a hard stop. Um, you'll probably still be able to use it, uh, but it should be just paying attention to trying to keep it in that range so it's most effective for you. Okay, perfect. So we'll do one last reminder, folks. A uh, few minutes left for any and all questions. If we don't get a chance to answer your questions directly while we're connected here today, use the email address sales at globaltestsupply.com. They'll either be myself or one of my colleagues who are able to address you uh, directly. And we'll hold on for maybe 10, 15 seconds uh, to see any last minute stragglers come in in terms of questions, and which I'll take the opportunity, Ken, to thank you very much uh, once again for your presentation. Uh, lots of information. <laughs> if, you know, if, if it's an information overload, take time to, to you know, take it all in. And again, uh, if any questions come up after the fact, please use uh, our contact info uh, email address uh, is sales at globaltestsupply.com. So nothing is coming in that meantime. So uh, again, Ken, thank you very much. No, thank you guys. And thank you all these that attended. I appreciate your attention and, uh, and the questions are excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. So on behalf of Global Test Supply and Global Test Supply University, we thank you for attending our webinar today. We hope you found it informative and helpful. Uh, Global Test Supply are here to assist you in any way. Visit our website, globaltestsupply.com, for anything that you need, including our contact information. I'll say it one more time just so everyone has it and it's burned in, in your memory, sales at globaltestsupply.com. Uh, shortly following the end of this webinar, a short survey uh, will be yours to complete. Uh, we ask you to do so, so uh, we can use your feedback to help us improve 
uh, and to bring us uh, to bring you more topics uh, about for webinars that you're more interested in as well. Uh, also, don't forget that as a thank you for attending today's webinar, your name will be entered in the draw to win $100 uh, for your next online order. The winner will be announced on our social media channels, so please be sure to check us out there. So once again, Ken, thank you very much. Thank you all, and I will wish you all a great rest of the day. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Be safe.